this is great for me. Um, the, uh, the cultural plan was a couple years out of my life in the 80s, and uh, it, it is such fun to see it coming back. <laughs> and uh, Mayor Emanuel has said, as part of his cultural policy, he wants to revisit the original Chicago cultural plan, update it, and bring it back as a blueprint <coughs> for the city. The, the original one was very much a product of its times, um, and I need to give you background on, on why, it, why it is the way it is. Um, <clears throat> so let's go back to 1983. Um, the mayor of Chicago is Jane Byrne, who uh, was the first woman mayor, beat the machine uh, because of uh, snowstorms. And so there was this, this outrage against the machine because they couldn't get the streets cleaned. Jane Byrne became the mayor. Um, she's running for re-election in 1983, and uh, this is a time where the mayor of Chicago was elected through a primary system initially. So there was a Democratic primary for mayor, a Republican primary for mayor, and then a general election. So opposing Jane Byrne was Richie Daly, who was at that time the state's attorney of Cook County. Uh, and Jane Byrne represented the, uh, the North Side Irish, Richie Daly represented the South Side Irish. Third candidate in the race was Harold Washington, who was an African American and a congressman who I think uh, actually represented uh, the Hyde Park uh, area at the time. Um, now, how many of you are from Chicago? Okay. Um, Chicago, as you know, is a very segregated city. Uh, the game we used to play was if you went to uh, uh, the downtown uh, subway station at uh, State and Lake and you s stood in front of the, uh, the turnstiles, you could look at the faces of the people going through the turnstiles and by looking at their faces decide whether they were going north to Howard or south to 95th Street. It's a segregated city. Racial politics are very much a part of Chicago. So, budding political scientists. You have three candidates in the race. You have two white candidates, one African-American candidate, three-way primary. Who wins the primary? Harold Washington wins the primary because he keeps an absolutely solid African-American vote, and the white vote splits uh, between Jane Byrne and Richie Daley. Now, in modern memory, Republican has never been elected mayor of Chicago, not since the days of Prohibition, Big Bill Thompson, uh, you know, early, <coughs> early pre-war. So Harold Washington, having won the Democratic primary, it should be a given that he becomes mayor in the general election. But suddenly, the, uh, the white Republican candidate, a very nice guy named Bernie Epton, um, is polling 46 47% uh, in the polls. And, and Perry, do you remember those days? Do you remember where, where Bernie Epton is in this? Um, and Bernie Epton, who up until that time, he was a lawyer, moderate Republican, very decent guy, his campaign slogan was, vote for Bernie Epton before it's too late. And when he got called on it, he said, what do you mean, before it's too late? Do you know how bad Chicago's infrastructure is? The streets are crumbling, but we've got to fix the water, the water mains. That's what I mean, because I'm a good Republican businessman. Vote for me before it's too late, because I can fix the infrastructure of the city. <coughs> but we all knew, everybody knew, he knew what vote for Bernie Epton before it's too late meant. So if you're Harold Washington, uh, who instead of being 90% in the polls as the Democratic candidate, is only at 46, 47% in the polls. And you're running against this white candidate who's also at 46, 47% in the polls. And at this point, um, the Hispanic population, although it's increasing in Chicago, they aren't registering to vote. So they're really not a factor in this. So you got the Asians and Native Americans and all the other ethnic groups, but this is really a black-white election. <coughs> so if you're Harold Washington, what do you do to skim off uh, enough white votes holding your African-American base to win for mayor. And uh, there were a lot of uh, task forces that were set up. But one of the task forces that was set up was an arts and culture task force. 
And Harold Washington thought that's really good because um, if I can uh, skim off enough, enough whites because of the arts, you know, one or two extra percentage points, everything counts. And so the task force recommended and the mayor promised, he said, Chicago has never had a unified arts policy, unified cultural policy. Because what Jane Byrne had been doing, Jane Byrne had been making deals. She was making a deal with the Rouse Company, which um, had built Inner Harbor in Baltimore and Peniel Hall in Boston. They were going to take over Navy Pier. She had, uh, she had destroyed State Street and made it a pedestrian mall and stopped all traffic, all street traffic in, on State Street. She had done a lot of these <coughs> bits and pieces arts stuff, but no overall plan. So he says, I'm going to give you a cultural plan. And Harold Washington gets elected. Who knows whether his promise to create a cultural plan is one of the things that does it. We all like to think it did. Who knows? Anyway, he gets elected. And at some point, he's got to fulfill this promise because a lot of the people on these task forces were saying, uh, we want you to follow through. So um, he was, at the time, you know, a congressman from, from Illinois. And I was, at that time, working for a guy named Sid Yates, who is the patron saint in Congress of the Arts. Um, he was chairman of the uh, Appropriations Committee, which funded all of the federal arts programs. Uh, and he had beaten back uh, every attempt during the culture wars to abolish the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, and the way he had done it was by recognizing how political the arts were. And he had made sure that the Arts Endowment was in a subcommittee that he controlled that not only included the uh, Arts and Humanities Endowment and the Smithsonian, the National Gallery, and the uh, Institute of Museum and Library Services, but it also included the Department of the Interior and the fossil programs of the Department of Energy. So that when these uh, conservative Westerners would say, we don't think there should be any money for the arts, he'd say, fine, if you zero out the arts, I'm going to take away all the federal grazing rights that your constituents have been able to get for free. I'm going to take away the uh, coal mines that have been giving subsidies to your people. And so he learned to trade the arts. And what I learned from him, working for him for about seven years, was, was how political the arts are. So Mayor Washington is elected mayor, has to do a cultural plan. He goes to his friend on the Illinois delegation, Sid Yates, who's the arts congressman, and asks if I, the arts staffer on the arts congressman staff, can go work for him and create a cultural plan for the city of Chicago. And I thought, wow, you know? <laughs> First, what a pretentious thing, create a cultural plan for the city. Um, but uh, who wouldn't take that up? So I was, I was delighted. I thought, this is great. But because I had worked for Sid Yates for seven years, I had read cultural plans from you know, cities all over the country because cultural planning was becoming um, you know, the flavor du jour. Um, there had been uh, a groundbreaking work called, called The Economics of Amenities, uh, which started in, in the late 70s, <coughs> went into the early 80s, which started talking about how um, you should use the arts not only to give money to artists, but also get the arts involved in decision making about housing, about transportation, about streets and sand, really integrate the arts into city life, make the cities more livable. And if cities are more livable, they prosper, they bring people in, they spend more money. So a lot of cities had started doing cultural planning. And they were all the same. Um, they'd be announced by a big press conference that they're going to do a cultural plan. There'd be an expert who was hired with maybe a group of uh, 10 or 15 consultants and other experts. They'd sit in a room. Six months later, they'd come out with a cultural plan. They'd have a second press conference. The city now has a cultural plan. And then most of them died. And they certainly didn't survive an administration. And so what I wanted to do was to see if we could create a cultural plan which could survive an administration, which could last beyond that second press conference. And what we decided to do, and no other city had tried this before, was to use the basics of grassroots organizing and political campaigning to create a cultural plan. And the way you do it is you go into neighborhoods. You go into a neighborhood, you say, you know, who do I need to talk to to get anything done in this neighborhood? You meet with that person, 
you expand the circle, you expand the circle, you expand the circle. And we did this in every community area in the city. Uh, now at this time, Chicago, you know, the mayor won, but he hadn't, he's in, he isn't running the city yet because the city council is divided into what was called at that time culture wars, where the white aldermen were against the, uh, the liberal white aldermen and the black aldermen. And a lot of stuff wasn't getting done. And there were neighborhoods where you couldn't really go into and say, I'm from Harold Washington, uh, you know, I want, I, want to, I want to organize in your community. So we still did it uh, by in trying to co-opt the other side, by going in, by certainly letting the aldermen know that we were going into their neighborhood to talk about the arts, to talk about culture. Um, and part of it is they didn't take us seriously enough to be worried about us because we were the arts. But as we were going in, we collected mailing lists, we collected databases, we said, we're going to hold a public meeting, we want you to be a co-sponsor, uh, give us your mailing list, we'll send out the notices for you. We said to the aldermen, uh, come be a co-sponsor, we're not trying to hide anything, come speak at our public meeting. Um, and we got a, a grant from the Chicago Community Trust for about $285,000. To, to do the cultural plan because they, they were intrigued by what we were trying to do. And we got a little money from the National Endowment for the Arts Locals Program because they also were intrigued. And I used some of that money to hire a not-for-profit documentary TV company to follow us around. First, so that we could document the process and, and, and second, so that we could come up with a um, a product that we could show in communities later on to explain what we had been trying to do. One of the benefits of that was that um, you know, we'd invite the aldermen to come to one of our public meetings. And aldermen had no interest in the arts. They would come in, though, and they would be at a union hall on a Tuesday night and it would be snowing, and they'd see 300 of their constituents. And they would have deathbed conversions about the arts. <laughs> and they would say, you know, I'm so delighted to see you all here. I'm so delighted that, that you're participating in, in, in city government and you're giving your ideas to city government. And I want to let you know that when this cultural plan comes to the city council, I'm going to support it. And we got every one of those people on tape <laughs> saying they were endorsing the cultural plan. So that by the time we actually did come to the city council and had our press conference, we had two-thirds of the city council on tape saying they would support this plan when the vote came. And for us, the organizing part, uh, we, we didn't care how people wanted to meet. If they wanted to meet by neighborhood, we would, have them, we would meet by neighborhood. Um, if they wanted to meet by ethnic group, we would have separate ethnic group meetings. We would have separate um, arts discipline meetings. We didn't care how they got together as long as they came together and they came up with their ideas for the plan. Now, you know, I love this plan. I spent two years on this plan. Uh, there is not one original recommendation in this plan. This, this group, if we sat together for a couple weeks, for a month, we could come up with every recommendation that's in this plan. There's no recommendation in this plan which wasn't in some other city's plan. But when we had our second press conference, we had had over 300 public meetings. We had had over 10,000 people who had actually come to these meetings and made the recommendations that show up in this plan. And we had a political base that when the plan was introduced, we're going to say to their aldermen, I helped write this plan. I want to see what's going to happen to it. And I used to get criticized for, for raising expectations. But I said, that's the point. We're in council wars. We're in a situation where people aren't going to do what the mayor wants just because he says he wants it. I want, if, I want people to feel that if they don't get this cultural plan, they're going to be angry because their expectations were raised because they had gone to those meetings in the middle of the night and written those recommendations. And they're going to pound on the doors of their aldermen in City Hall and say, what's happened? 
why isn't this being introduced, especially when you told me at that meeting you were going to support it. So that was the point. The other point of this was to raise the um, uh, profile of the new Department of Cultural Affairs, which got created as part of the Harold Washington administration. And you know, cultural affairs was not being taken seriously. And I used to have huge fights with the, uh, the first uh, commissioner of cultural affairs, this wonderful guy named Fred Fine, who was very much a man of the people, you know, sort of the whole populist idea of what the plan was about. And he would not take the car that commissioners of city departments were given as part of their job because he, he thought that was just too high and mighty. And I said, you've got to take the car because the person who's the commissioner of streets and sand is not going to take you seriously if you don't have a car, because they're not going to think you're a real department commissioner. And so, well, two things we wanted to do. One, create a plan. Number two, create a department of city government which would be taken seriously so that when the Department of Housing was doing a project, they would call us in for the arts parts of it. When planning was making their own plans, they would bring us in because we were the experts on cultural planning. We put together, as I said, a, a a 25-minute broadcast quality tape, which we showed on Channel 11 a few times, uh, to explain the process. And then we used it to go around afterwards. I'm going to show that to you, and then we can sort of talk about a little bit the, the aftermath and how it, what I think can happen with uh, Mayor Emanuel. OK. So now I'm told I can just push, I push the button, right? And that should, this should do it. And I push the play DVD. Yeah. I always think, especially those of us who are involved in the arts, we shouldn't be the ones who walk out when credits of the people who actually are producing arts are rolling. So I always like to keep the credits on. Um, so of course, Mayor Washington uh, endorses the plan in March of 1987. He dies in November of 1987. And the question is, does the plan continue on? Um, <coughs> Mayor Sawyer takes over and pretty much fires everybody in the Department of Cultural Affairs who's in the policy positions at that point. But we had a lot of people out there who said, what's going on with the cultural plan? And one of the things that we had really pushed for was the creation of um, local arts councils, neighborhood arts councils. And so there were places like the Near Northwest Side Arts Council, which kept going, kept it moving. And uh, a lot of the aldermen who we had gotten kept it, kept it going. Uh, under Mayor Daley and uh, Commissioner Weisberg, uh, the cultural plan wasn't discussed so much in terms of giving credit for the recommendations, but they did a lot of the stuff that we had in there. Um, and it ended up being, uh, they, they forgot, I think, a lot about the, the bottom-up part of the plan. Uh, it, there was a, a movement to, to revisit the plan 10 years after that. Uh, instead, the Daly administration, as you know, was very much top-down, and the mayor you know, vision came out of his head, and he said, this is what I want. But Many of the recommendations continued on. And then, uh, as we were saying at the very beginning, uh, Mayor Emanuel and uh, Commissioner uh, Michelle Boone are really sort of embracing the idea of the cultural plan and having that blueprint again. Uh, what I'm hoping is that um, Mayor Emanuel, as you know, is, is, is not a patient person. And he's not going to let a plan cook for, for 18 months. Uh, so they've. Uh, He's given sort of directions to the Department of Cultural Affairs, get this plan out much sooner. Uh, Michelle Boone, I think, understands what, we're, what we were trying to do. She's stretching out the timeline a little bit. Uh, but it's going to be a quicker process. Uh, and my great hope is that they, um, they keep the political side of this. Uh, because ultimately, it's the only thing which keeps it going if um, the decision maker changes his or her mind. Um, I'm going to talk about it than any other. Can we open up to some questions? And yeah. What is the state of Austin now in terms of cultural? Austin continues to have a, a pretty, uh, pretty robust community. Uh, they do continue to do the arts there. They, like everybody else, has really been uh, destroyed by the economy. Um, it continues to be a, a fairly diverse community and uh, uh, a very strong one. Yeah. 
Um, funding for this kind of activity, it, has the mayor committed to uh, uh, funds to implement a plan? What I've been told <coughs> by people who have who've met with him to present ideas is that Mayor Manuel says if, if you come in and you have an idea which does not either save money or generate money, he shows you the door. And the problem with that is some of these things require a little bit of seed money and then you can, you can get a lot of results afterwards. Right now he's not interested in that. He says every nickel that, that he can save goes into the hole to, to make up the deficit. Does that point of view feed the way the plan is um, put together? Um, it's going to change some of the recommendations. What, what Mayor Manuel has not been bashful at all about is uh, twisting the arms of the private sector to fund things. So I think a lot of the parts of the plan, the communications <coughs> parts, the, uh, uh, the, the space stuff, you know, if, if all it takes is changing a, a zoning ordinance to make it easier for artists to have live workspace and do sweat equity, and it's not going to cost the city any money, I think those things will still go forward. Anything that's going to take some money, even if it's just a little bit up front, uh, I think the Cultural Affairs Department is going to have to say, we have got, this is the list of funders that we can go to who are willing to do it. Carol. Hey Michael, what's the state of, of the city's data at this point that they can <laughs> use to make their case? Whatever the it's, this is This is always the problem. Um, the, um, the, easiest, the easiest one for legislators to understand is, 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 of course, economic impact of the arts. Uh, as Carol and I were talking about, I think it's also one of the phoniest of all, of all the studies. Uh, because um, you know, the classic economic impact of the arts, you, uh, you bring an artist into, into a bad neighborhood, they, start, they either put up, put up a performing arts space, they put up a gallery, people start coming to the area, uh, they're paying for, uh, for babysitters, restaurants get started around there, so restaurants get started up, paying cab drivers now. Um, the streets become safer because more people are coming, and suddenly that one dollar you put in the arts to, to help that, that artist, it, it, you, you've now got uh, Paradise uh, on 57th Street. The problem with most economic impact of the arts studies is that they, they look at recirculated money rather than new money. And the thing is, if I'm going to spend a dollar, um, if I don't spend it on the arts, will I spend it to go see the White Sox, or will I go spend it to go see a movie, or will I go spend it to, to go bowling? And if that's all you're doing, it's not really economic impact of the arts. The only place where I think you truly see economic impact of the arts is cultural tourism, where um, you get people from outside the city bringing in fresh money that wouldn't otherwise be spent in the city. Now, uh, I was talking about this to some of my, actually, some of my students at the School of the Art Institute, and uh, what we were talking about is that, however, if you can get somebody to take that dollar, which they would have just kept in their pocket, and spend it on the arts, I think that is economic impact. But I've never seen an, an economic impact of the arts study which has not, has not just mixed everything together, both the recirculated dollars as well as the new dollars which wouldn't have been spent except for this, that art. But they also have about one-tenth the amount of data that they need to be accurate. Right. Yes, and it's way too expensive to do the, the full board hmm. study. But in terms of giving something to an alderman, giving something to a state legislator, if, and, and Americans for the Arts does this really well, it works terrific. That one page says, you put that dollar in for the arts, you're going to get back X number, of whatever your multiplier you choose that day uh, in, in return. Yeah. Um, what, what do we know at this point about um, how the formation of the, cultural, the new cultural plan is going to proceed methodologically? <coughs> um, it's unclear now. I've, I've had a couple talks with, 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 with Michelle Boone. Uh, they're, they're just starting to put it together. Um, they do have a new Cultural Affairs Advisory Board, which is headed by uh, uh, Nora Daly, the uh, former mayor's daughter, and, and, and Marge Halperin. Uh, and uh, they will be, I think, very actively involved in setting how they're going to do it. Uh, M Michelle gets it. I think, and, and Michelle, I think, really wants to see if, if we can do one that, that creates a political base as, as well as just creating the recommendations. Because I say, th I, I think personally, the recommendations are the easiest part of a cultural plan. And you know, Mayor Emanuel is already coming in. He says, well, this, you know, he wants this cultural hub. He wants this uptown music center. He wants this thing in Bronzeville. 
you know, he's got seven recommendations he already wants to see in this plan, no matter what the, the public support might be. Uh, the key, I think, is, is, is to get that political support so that somebody is saying, this may not be what we really want. Does that kind of come um, the, I was looking at this as a political plan. So the data I really wanted to collect was um, names, addresses, uh, being able to reach those people, uh, getting them, uh, if necessary, you know, at the next stage, registered to vote so that we had a political movement to support the plan. The, the needs are out there. Uh, and I think as Carol said, you know, we, we need to get the data so that we can justify the needs we already know are, are, are around. But, but for me, I, um, since I, I, I really believed I knew what the recommendations were going to be before we started this thing, I wanted the political base and I wanted the political organizing side uh, to, to, to be working. Yeah, please. Just a um, well, I was just going to mention since so many of the questions dealt with data is um, I work for the Chicago Community Trust, so in addition to contributing money again, one of the things that I contribute is a lot of vitality indicators that weren't available back in the day. You know, mm -hmm. The city has been capturing at yeah. least those things that will show you, you know, <coughs> when they're geocoded, we can show where are the festivals, where are the public places mm -hmm. of amusement licenses, mm -hmm. where yeah. are the various opportunities that currently exist and where is there inequity and disparity. And please give them more money. I, I, when I let, talked to Michelle the first time around, she said that the community trust had offered 100000 And I said, you know, 25 years ago, they gave us 285000 to do this plan. So give them more money. <laughs> yeah, Larry, Larry. Is there going to be comparative data? I mean, uh, in terms of uh, how Chicago's uh, uh, cultural vitality stacks up? against that of other cities, or is it just going to be neighborhood competing against downtown? Because oh. it sounds like you're saying, I mean, you're saying, you know, you have that aside where you say you don't, you don't think that we should, we, we, we should be able to say we don't want this recommendation from the mayor. It sounded like you're saying because mm -hmm. it's too focused on the lakefront, not enough on the mm -hmm. neighborhoods. So I'm hearing a lot of, like, populist rhetoric mm -hmm. about the distribution of the arts <coughs> within the city and the idea about vitality within the city being distributed more equitably. But I'm wondering whether the mayor might not be more interested in the vitality of Chicago versus other cities as a means of attracting, you know, human capital in mm -hmm. the way that the creative city's uh, uh, urban policy talking game has been for quite some time now. Well, it, it, I think it's, that's a great question, and and of course, it, I think that for 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 most mayors, that's what they. Th I think that's how they think. Uh, make and, and what Daly did was let's make center city. The, the greatest thing in the world because that's going to bring Boeing in. Um, I think Boeing came in because they gave them $135 million in tax credits, much more than because uh, we, we have a world-class symphony. And I, I, you know, obviously it's, it's, it's a mix of that, but, but ultimately it was if, if Boeing had been offered uh, $200 million in tax credits by somebody else, I think they would have gone there even though the arts might not have been as good. Um, from what I've heard, the cultural plan is going to set the tone for the overall mission of the Department mm -hmm. of Culture and Special Events. Um, and there are kind of two different modes of thought. One, that department can provide art services to residents and tourists. The other mode is potentially providing support to the creative communities. Um, I was wondering if you had an idea on which of those two avenues they're leaning towards uh, in the new cultural plan and in the new direction of the department. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's essential that we do both. When, when we were creating the cultural plan the first time, we wanted this sort of arts integration. We wanted to be at the table when, other, when others were making decisions so that the only thing cultural affairs, we didn't want the only thing for cultural affairs to do was to be giving grants out to artists um, because that, I think that ghettoized us. Um, and so we wanted to be there when decisions were made by everybody else. The key, though, is not to forget <laughs> about the artists. I, I think one of the big problems with the, the National Endowment for the Arts today is that um, they are getting really good at you know, this, this whole thing, the art works, and they're doing some terrific things with HUD and other, and other agencies. And I love that because we've been fighting for that for years. But they're doing that totally, I think, at the, um, the disadvantage 
of the grants to arts organizations. And they have become, um, I think, a very timid organization. And one of the things that, uh, you know, I, I, had, I had the privilege to be on the, the Obama Arts Policy Task Force. And the one thing which everybody on that task force said was bring back individual grants to artists, be, um, which had flown away during the culture wars because the, the only things that ever embarrassed a public arts agency was an individual grant. Uh, and so we thought it's finally time. Let's start, let's start recognizing the artists. Let's start going back to what Roger Stevens, the very first chair of the National Endowment for the Arts said, which was um, we want the arts endowment to be edgy. We want the arts endowment to do things that the private sector wasn't ready to do yet. And we really hoped that that would be the next, the next step. Instead, the arts endowment, since the culture wars, has really flipped it around. And it's, they wait until the private sector has made something safe, and then the arts endowment gets involved in it. Uh, so I, I'm really hoping we, we, we have both parts. That we bring back city arts to a, to a real level, but at the same time, we make sure that the art, the Department of Cultural Affairs is there when planning is doing something, when economic development is doing something, when streets and sands doing something. Yeah. Uh, what is the commissioner doing, and I guess the mayor, about uh, preserving arts in the schools? Um, <clears throat> There's a, um, there's a lot of stuff going on right now. I was uh, at a meeting of uh, Arts Alliance Illinois last week, and Nick Rabkin uh, was, give, was giving the talk about, about what they're trying to do with teaching artists and, and, and getting, getting that back. Um, it's, there's a tension, because you know, are, are teaching artists people who are taking away the jobs of arts educators? Are they assisting them? And we're still getting into this this, the same debate that we have about arts integra about integration with city government with respect to teaching. Uh, places like uh, CAPE, Chicago Arts Partnership and Education, is really pushing this idea of arts integration, uh, using, using art teachers to assist in the teaching of history and the teaching of math. Uh, Carol was just telling me before we talked, you know, he says, well, the response to that is why don't you just have better math teachers instead of bringing artists in to help teach math. Uh, and so I, you know, I think it's, in, it's really in flux. I'm not sure where it's going, but there's, there's certainly a big push. You know, it's coming out of the Cultural Policy Institute about using, using teaching artists, bringing them in, while at the same time keeping uh, arts integration in other topic areas. Yeah. So you're, you're a politics guy, and politics drives the money, and most of the money that's coming to arts, at least my understanding in Chicago, comes from the hotel, motel fund, a few other sources. Um, what's your, what can the arts community do to prevent the focus of the cultural plan and ultimately department from going back to tourism because that's where the, their you know, money comes from? Register to vote. Nothing more important. Go to your alderman and say, I can guarantee you my vote and somebody else's vote. This is important to me. Uh, I, I, I do a lot of advocacy training. And um, the... Uh, the, main, the key to advocacy is there has to be some pain for somebody to say no to you. And if you just come in and say, I'm for the arts, arts are wonderful, and you know, this is good, uh, there's no pain in saying, uh, well, the arts are wonderful, but, but so is infrastructure, uh, so, are, so is education, so is everything else. Uh, there has to be something where you can say, if you say no, there is at least some discomfort that you're going to feel because you're saying no. Uh, well, I, I, I think this plan, just because it, 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 it's, at a, it's at a different time and, and for me the status of data collection is so much better, I think this, 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 this revisited cultural plan is certainly going to have a much more sophisticated evaluation process than, than ours did. Um, I, but I, I don't know. Given the age in this room, I'm sure you've noticed that what, what they didn't have during the last <laughs> round was the, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. and I'm just curious from all of you, how can the, this wonderful engagement effort be made more engaging now that that, that tool is available for many? Yeah, that, 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 that's, that's a great point. And um, the, the key, uh, what, what, what um, advertising experts say, you know, it, it used to be 
what does it take to get the message through all the clutter? And clutter has become so much greater. You know, we're, we're, we're bombarded 5,000 messages a day. So number one is how do you get the message through the clutter? But more important than getting the message through the clutter is finding a way to get somebody to act when they get that message. And so the, the, the information exchange, I think, is so much more sophisticated than it was in our time. But the same problem exists of once you get the message, what does it take to get you to do something as a result of it? Yeah. Well, has anybody else done it really well? I mean, have any other cities recently done or, um, cultural plans that have each have used the internet as a tool like that? To, to I don't. I don't. I don't know. Um, um, yeah, I think we're, we're going to um, explore a little okay. bit of that. You know, <laughs> as far as we can. But we're we're looking around for, for other models and hope to bring people for talking. Michael, will we see this by next fall, do you think? We'll, we'll see the, a draft? Yeah, I, I mean, I think Mich Mich Michelle has certainly been given a direction that it's... Uh, it's got to be reasonable. Yeah, it's, it's not going to be 18 months. It's going to be at least you know, at, at the outside a year less if she can get something done before then. Good. This is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one minute. The, as far as the National Cultural Data Project is involved, could you talk a little bit about how, if that is being used as part of this cultural plan, or I think they've recently come into Illinois and started to, to build? I, I think very much so. And one of the, the good things that Michelle Boone has been doing, she's been working with Rod Joy at, at Arts Alliance Illinois, uh, who's been very, very active in, 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 that, in that project uh, with, with Americans for the Arts and, and others. And they also, um, I think here is where you're working on, on getting the, uh, the the cultural vitality index, it's and right, yeah, and and, and I, that that's really important. And I, I think more and more of those those tools that we use with all these other subject areas, using them for the arts is going to be really important. Susie, could you just mention a little bit about where service vitality indicators will be and how it Yeah, if you go to metropulse.org, uh, it's uh, there'll be the regional data will all be put up there in October, uh, and then we will be uh, tailoring that once the consultant is hired by the city to create more user-friendly PDF-type presentations that correlates by neighborhood. So for Logan Square, for Uptown, for Garfield Park, for Austin, we can not only take the indicators that we've collected from the Illinois Cultural Data Project, from employment and labor figures, from PPA licenses, festival permits, block party closures, we can take all of that and correlate it to indicators of crime, of um, uh, educational levels, of age, income, and then consumer-generated data through uh, Scarborough. So there'll be a <coughs> lot of data that those of you who are savvy enough can pull off of Metropulse and use yourself, but there'll also be a city website where you can go and just access pre-packaged neighborhood <coughs> set data sets. There was one other person. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.